Janet Napolitano, thank you for joining us on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you. We implemented incredible changes in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. You argue we need to evaluate those. Which ones and why? Well, um, I wrote the book, How Safe Are We? Uh, Homeland Security Since 9-11. Uh, to uh, explain the department, which is greatly misunderstood. Mm -hmm. It has very broad responsibilities, uh, counterterrorism, intelligence gathering, cybersecurity, uh, protection of our land borders, our sea borders, our air travel, um, uh, our disaster response and resilience. You know, FEMA is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and as we've created this department, which is the largest reorganization of the federal government since the creation of the Department of Defense after World War II. Um, now it's the third largest department uh, in the federal government. Uh, the risks that it has to deal with, you know, have changed. So uh, when it started, um, it, it, it was focused on al-Qaeda, it was focused on um, aviation security. Uh, the things that gave rise to the attack of 9-11. Um, uh, over the lifespan of the department, uh, we've seen other risks emerge and evolve. And so the department has had to evolve as well. So, I mean, that was one of the biggest changes, was the actual creation of, of the Homeland Security. Um, and it was supposed to address the lack of information sharing that among agencies which came to light after the 9-11 attacks. How successful has it been in reaching that goal? So more information is shared. I, I actually think um, it has been fairly successful. Um, there are lots of agencies, like 17 or 18 in the federal government, that have some kind of intelligence gathering function. Uh, and uh, during the time I was secretary from 2009 to 2013, uh, um, I, I saw a, a lot of uh, sharing amongst those agencies and uh, a lot of analysis shared amongst those agencies. So at that time, it was definitely improved over what it was prior to 9-11. Um, but, you know, information sharing um, is, it can always be better, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's never a, a perfect closed circle. So. Um, what I, I'm concerned about now is whether, uh, instead of continuing on a positive trajectory, we're actually going backwards. Talk about that. How are we making mistakes in evaluating true threats? Well, uh, I think the biggest threat uh, or the biggest mistake is uh, to kind of focus only on the southwest border as if that is a danger to the safety and security of the American people. Look, the South, I know the southwest border very well. I, I grew up here in New Mexico. Uh, I spent most of my adult life in Arizona as the U.S. attorney, the attorney general, then the governor. Um, and also, I've, I've walked that border. I've ridden it on horseback. I've flown over it. And I just, I know it. And, uh, you know, the border is a zone. It needs to be managed. It needs to be managed in accord with our law and with our values. Uh, but it is not is itself a risk to the safety of the American people. If you watch the news now, you'd think the Department of Homeland Security was the Department of the Southwest Border and that that was all that it was responsible for, when in fact uh, um, it's responsible for many other functions. And um, uh, I'm, I am concerned that uh, the overfocus on the Southwest Border is detracting from the department and the federal government's ability to deal with other more pressing challenges. We are recording this uh, just shortly after the mass shooting in El Paso, which was apparently driven by, uh, perpetrated by someone who had white supremacist views. Should we consider white supremacist groups terrorist organizations? I think we should. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the gaps in the federal law, <laughs> the federal criminal law, is that there's no specific criminal violation for domestic terrorism. So prosecutors have to characterize it as a hate crime hmm. or uh, if there was somebody in law enforcement who was injured or killed, they can uh, charge it that way. Um, uh, but 
Wow. When, for example, the U.S. attorney announces they're going to address this as a domestic terrorism case, mm -hmm. they can from an investigative perspective, but not from an actual charging decision perspective. So we need to change the law to address that? I think so. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I also think we need to recognize uh, that um, in terms of terrorist incidents that have caused loss of life, leaving aside the, the terrible loss of life on 9-11, but, but since then, there's been more actual loss of life attributable to domestic terrorists than those influenced by um, foreign Islamist organizations. What are the biggest threats that you see right now to Homeland Security? You know, I, I would say three. Um, one of those three is definitely uh, the rise of domestic terrorism and mass gun violence. Um, and we've already mentioned a, a gap in the federal law. Um, but uh, uh, I think and hope it is high time uh, to enact some gun safety measures at the federal level, universal background checks. I think we ought to reconsider the ban on assault weapons because uh, the use of those assault weapons um, uh, enlarges the loss of life and the numbers of people injured uh, when these incidents occurred. Um, uh, but it takes some political will and courage uh, by uh, the members of our Congress and, and by the President. And, uh, 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 but, you know, the, the, the people of the United States, I think, are beginning to, really to speak out, and they're going to need to speak out to push their congressional leaders to do the right thing. Two other risks, mm -hmm. uh, cybersecurity, uh, huge, complicated, has evolved a great deal. You know, when I started as secretary, I spent maybe 10% of my time on cybersecurity. By the time I left, it was a good 40% of my time. And now we've seen uh, ransomware attacks, denial of service attacks, different kinds of hacking, the theft of personal information. Uh, and uh, we've seen an attack on our democracy mm -hmm. itself uh, in the 2016 election. And with no confidence that that has been adequately dealt with or that um, that infiltration uh, of our electoral process by the Russians is, is, is not still continuing. I think uh, the intelligence community has concluded and warned us that it is continuing, uh, but we have no national plan on how to deal with it. Um, and, the, and the third risk, mass gun violence, cybersecurity, the third risk I would identify are the risks associated with global warming. Now, why is that a homeland security threat? I was just going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, you, when you step back, um, uh, we are seeing a, 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 a perceptible increase in uh, migration from south to north across the planet. Um, uh, and we're, we are having the creation of so-called climate refugees, um, people leaving their homelands uh, because of extreme drought that's destroyed the agricultural economy, the, uh, the rise in new types of plant disease that has destroyed the crops. Uh, the coffee crop in Guatemala has been basically destroyed by something called coffee rust. Um, leaving all of those small farmers without any, you know, way to earn an income. Uh, and so we have, we, we have that, and we have areas of the world where, um, uh, due to global warming, as I mentioned, uh, the local economies have been affected and destroyed, uh, leaving uh, a population of primarily young men uh, growing up uh, uh, hopeless, uh, uh, helpless, um, and ripe for terrorist recruitment. And I think we can see some of the after effects of that in, in actually in Syria and in Yemen. Um, uh, so that obviously uh, ultimately affects um, Homeland Security. But another way is if you think of Homeland Security as protecting human life and property in the United States so that we are secure. The increase in extreme weather events related to global warming is um, uh, really uh, quite astounding. Um, uh, landfall hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, drought in the western United States that's led to massive wildfire with, with loss of life and, and property. We had the campfire in California last year, mm -hmm. uh, basically took out an entire town, 85 dead, 
uh, and and hundreds other of others left homeless and uh, uh, or injured by by the fire. What should we be doing from a homeland security standpoint to well, address these impacts of global warming? Yeah, so two things. Uh, one is uh, we should, as a country, do our part to reduce the amount of carbon that's being emitted into the atmosphere. I think we should rejoin the Paris Accords. Uh, 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 that would be a, a first step. A second step is uh, to focus on adaptation to the climate change that already has occurred or that we know is going to occur within the near future. Rising sea levels affect where we rebuild communities, um, where we site things like airport runways. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, having a real discussion and um, a plan with how we deal with that is essential. Uh, the materials we use in building homes and buildings and bridges, et cetera, um, all have to be built with an eye toward climate change. Um, these are critical infrastructure. They're supposed to be built to last 30 to 40 years. The climate is going to change over that period of time. So we need to also, from a homeland security perspective, actually um, uh, have a plan for adaptation. You write about real security versus security theater. What do you mean by that? Security theater is uh, when um, you do, do things that make you look tough, um, but that have no perceptible uh, outcome in terms of improvement in our safety and security. Um, uh, I, I, I think returning to the southwest border, uh, m much of the political rhetoric associated with that is security theater. Real security um, uh, involves manpower, it involves technology, uh, it should be evidence-based and data-driven and uh, should have as its goal the increase in the safety of the American people. What should we be doing at the border that's different from what was happening now? Well, um, uh, uh, first of all, um, we uh, need to address uh, the population that's coming to our border. So when I was secretary, uh, we had increased manpower, um, technology at the ports of entry and between the ports of entry. And we drove illegal immigration to 40 plus year lows. And it was still going down uh, when I left the department. Uh, now, of course, we have this surge. And the surge is from basically three countries, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Uh, these are countries with very high homicide rates, highest in the world. Um, they have uh, uh, suffered from an infestation of gangs and gang violence. Um, they don't um, have necessarily stable civil institutions. Uh, we should invest in those countries. We should provide training and equipment so they have adequate police forces. Uh, we should help them develop and have independent judicial systems. Uh, I think we need to focus on the migration uh, from, from that part of the world, not by uh, waiting until they actually appear at our border, but trying to turn the, the faucet off at the source. Um, and I, you know that, to me, uh, would actually increase our border security. Building a wall will not increase our border security. Um, uh, uh, I used to say when I was the governor of Arizona, show me a 10-foot wall, I will show you an 11-foot ladder. Uh, you know, we have a 1,940-mile land border. Uh, some of those lands are public lands. Uh, some of them are privately owned. Some of them are owned by sovereign Indian nations. Um, all different kinds of topography, uh, desert, mountain, riparian, wetlands, you name it, you have it across that border. So just the cost, the expense, the time it would take to build a, a solid structure along that border um, would, would, would just doesn't make sense. What we should do um, is uh, we should make sure that the ports of entry through which 
hundreds of thousands of vehicles and pedestrians pass every day are well staffed and use the most current available technology. And then between the ports of entry, again, a strategy that layers manpower, um, equipment like ground sensors, tunnel detection equipment, air cover along the border. We used planes when I was secretary, now they can use drones. Um, uh, and, and to uh, uh, handle that in, in a way that uh, uh, increases the ability of the Border Patrol um, to apprehend those who are trying to cross illegally. Then, uh, for those who are seeking asylum, uh, we need to have a way to process those cases in accord with our values and the rule of law. Um, and to me, that means, I, I think of it as flooding the zone. Flood the zone with immigration judges. Uh, flood the zone with uh, individuals who can uh, help those who are seeking asylum. Uh, process those cases first. Um, and, and, and for those who are entitled to pursue their asylum claim, make that eligibility determination. Uh, and then don't detain them. Let them uh, go into the country, give them a return court date or what have you, and, and the rule of law can work in that way. Well, Janet Napolitano, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you.